So today, today I have a guest for you, a, a, a guest speaker all the way from Seattle, Washington. Uh, a friend of mine, I met him several years ago in a moment of my life where I just really needed a friend. You guys know that I've, I've been really big on talking about friendships and building relationships. And it kind of stemmed from the fact that I had a hard time making friends. I had a hard time finding people that wanted to do life with me and wanted to do ministry with me. And so uh, we were away on a, on a conference and we met this couple and they asked us out to dinner. And it was kind of the first time that a couple had ever asked us out to dinner. We were always the ones taking people out to dinner. And he just wanted to know my story and some of the things that I've been going through. And next thing I know, I felt like I was in a counseling session and I'm spilling my guts and all of my emotions to this person. And, and Brandon's a couple years younger than me and he looked across the table and said, hey, that's safe for you to talk that way with me because I'm another pastor, but don't talk like that again. And as a New Yorker, I'm like, oh, who are you talking to? Like, forget about it, you know? Um, but those words resounded in my heart that I, that I knew that there were some things in me as a leader that I needed to correct and I needed to shift. And he has an amazing ministry called Leading Second. He's a leadership coach, um, a, a leadership guru in his generation and what they're doing uh, in the church today. He's been involved in ministry his entire life. Uh, kind of like myself, and our styles and our, our ministries and, and who, what we're called to do are kind of similar, and so we've really hit it off together and hit it off well. Did an amazing job for a service, so would you welcome to the stage my friend, Brandon Stewart. Good morning, church. Anyone glad to be in church this morning? <laughs> Hey, I couldn't wait to get here this morning, and um, I have been a huge fan, borderline stalker of this church for quite a while, and um, I love what you are doing, and I've been so blessed by it. Love your pastors, love their family. Um, I'll echo back really quickly, quick sentiments, uh, because I really think honor is one of the most important things we can do the whole day. Um, a couple years ago, after we had met, um, my wife and I were about to take the biggest step of faith of our lives that we had taken up to that point. And we needed some friends. We needed some people to surround us, something big at the time to us in ministry we, we believed God wanted us to do. And so your pastor was on my list, and uh, he got my note. And I'll never forget, it was one Sunday morning early, and I got a text from him saying, hey, I'm in, we're with you. And so you all don't even know this, uh, but for the last uh, maybe almost couple of years, you have supported our ministry. Uh, you have given and you have sown into what we are attempting to do. My wife and I spend our life uh, working with leaders and pastors all over North America, U.S., Canada, now starting to do work in Mexico. And um, today we have a thriving ministry, thriving conference um, we have a podcast that's reached almost 100,000 people. And I, I say that to say, hold on. I say that to say that um, you all have had a significant part of it, whether you even knew it or not. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you, thank you, thank you for being so kingdom-minded that you were a generous church, fueling ministry. And so right back at you, Mike, thank you for being a friend when we needed a friend. Don't you think that's how the kingdom of God works? God just assigns you people along the way. And so I'm very, very grateful. One more time, will you help me honor your pastors, Pastor Mike and Cindy? They are two of the best anywhere. And I'm so grateful. And um, so thankful. Amen. And then, hey, um, hey, my church is 30, well, depending on how you do the math, probably over 40 years old. I've been a part of it for 37 years, one church my whole life. And I realize my church would be the same as this. We're also standing on the shoulders of giants. And thank you, Pastor Joe, for the, 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 just the legacy. Thank you for the head start. Thank you for being a pioneer, for, 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 for stepping out, for starting all this madness. <laughs> uh, I'm so grateful. I'm for the, thank you for the faithfulness. And um, anyways, would you do me one favor? Would you stand to your feet all over the room? I figure I have to stand for 30. You get to stand for three. Stand to honor the word of the Lord this morning. 
One more question for you. Is anyone thankful for the Word of God? Do you love the Word? You know, I may not know your name this morning. I may not know your story. I may not know what you're facing today. I may not know what you feel like is kind of staring you down right now. You may be in here today feeling like you're on top of the mountain, or you may feel like you have a mountain on your shoulders. Whatever the case may be, um, I may not know your name, and I may not know your story, but I know Jesus. I know his story. I know that his story has changed my story. I can't even imagine where my life would be if it wasn't for Jesus. And his story is certainly more than enough for your story. I don't know what you're facing today. But I know that the Word of God is living, and it's active, and it's sharper than a two-edged sword, and it, it accomplishes something when we open its pages, and we're about to do just that. And I came here this morning with a word really big in my heart just for the local church in this season. And I came here this morning to advocate to you for people who are not here yet. So I want to have a little bit of family talk today, if that's all right. This is family church, right? So I figure we're going to be family. So whether, you know, I like y'all well enough at this point. So whether I'm the really cool older brother that comes around or the annoying cousin you wish would leave, you don't get to pick your family. And we're going to be stuck with each other whether you like it or not. So we're just going to have some family talk today. But I actually came to call you higher today. I didn't, didn't come all the way from the West Coast to play it safe today and to tickle your ears. So I want to bring a message that may challenge you, may speak to you, but I, I pray that um, through the power of the word that it will do something in this house. So anyone that would join me, would you lift up your hands to heaven? Can we just take a moment, give God some space and prepare our hearts for the word? Come on, anyone that would join me, would you just begin to do some business with God all over this room? Would you just begin to go to that place that only you and the Lord more know about? Would you just say something to him this morning like, Lord, I'm available. God, God speak to us today. Oh God, we love your word. It is a light. It is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light to our path. Your word is freedom. Your word is truth. Your word is the anchor to our soul this morning, Jesus. Your word is the bread that we live on every single day. Your word sets the captive free. At your word, Jesus, blind eyes were opened. At your word, Father, things that were out of alignment were brought into alignment. And so I ask the same would be true today as we read from these pages. I pray they would become truth in our hearts and our lives. And now, God, I ask that I would get out of the way so that you can have your way. Come, Holy Spirit, and do all that you want to do in this place today. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said a big amen. Amen. Let's, amen. You can be seated. It's good to have my wife with me this morning. This is my wife of... Over 15 years. We just celebrated 15 years a couple of weeks ago. Give the pastor's wife wave if you would. This is my beautiful wife, Lindsay. We are crazy enough to believe that we could actually change the world. We're trying to do it. And crazy enough to believe that churches could be different. And so we spend our lives on behalf of our church and my pastor, Pastor Kevin Gerald uh, from Champion Center in Tacoma, Seattle, Washington. Um, we just spend our lives helping leaders and churches everywhere we can. And um, we have one daughter. Her name is Zane. I think we have a picture to put up this morning. There she is. Um, as you can tell, life is boring at our house. She has no personality whatsoever. And uh, if she was here, actually, she would want to preach today. And so there's only room for one preacher in the family today, Zane. So she's at home with Grandma and Grandpa. That's how that sounds. So anyways, uh, we love the church. I signed up as a local church fan a long time ago. I believe the local church is the greatest thing happening on planet Earth today. My life has been changed by the local church. And I believe that, um, you know, there's a lot of things you can invest your life in. There's a lot of clubs, organizations, Little League, YMCA. There's a, there's a lot of things you could spend your life doing. And they're all fine and good. But not one of them will change a life for eternity. But when you take your life, the seed of your life, and you plant it 
in the house of the Lord. Psalm 92, 13 says, planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. This is the place where life happens. This is the place of true family. This is the place where we come and God sets us free. He does a new work in our lives. And I really believe that the local church is meant to live on mission. Can I get a big amen this morning? We are not a country club. We are a battleship. And outside of our four walls, there is a world that is dying to know Jesus. This morning, in fact, someone woke up rooftops away from your home dying to know Jesus. And while one person remains that doesn't know the same hope that we woke up with this morning, how many of you know we have work to do as the church? We've got to stay on mission. We've got to stay diligent. We've got to stay busy. Um, there's a world to win for Jesus. And it's in that um, it's in that spirit today. I want to share a word with you today. I want to call us higher today. I want to bring a word that might challenge you. I want to bring a word that might stretch you. If you're looking for a title this morning, I want to ask us all today to make room. Make room. Someone turn to your neighbor and say, make room. And turn to your second choice neighbor and say, make room. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 54, verse 2, it says this, Enlarge the place of your tent. Let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Come on, someone turn to your neighbor and say, do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes, for you will spread out. It says in verse 3, you will spread abroad. To the right and to the left, and your offspring will possess the nations. We all find ourselves in seasons where we have to make room for more. I'll never forget many years ago, several years ago now, my wife walked out of the bedroom in our old apartment toward the kitchen with a pregnancy test with two blue lines on it and a what in the world did you just do to me look on her face shock we were pregnant and I'm thrilled she had to come around to being thrilled I think at the moment uh, we were pregnant new life was on the way new family was on the way and after the initial hugs and excitement what does your mind start doing We've got to make room. We've got to figure this sucker out. The car's not big enough. The house isn't big enough. We need a baby's room because new family is coming. New family's on the way, so we've got to make room for more. You see, Jesus arrived in a world that had no room for him. He arrived and was born in a stable, a cave, because there was no room in the inn, but more tragically, there was often no room for him in people's lives. He was immediately hunted by the governor. He was immediately resisted by the religious leaders of the day. He was immediately a, a risk, a threat to the occupying forces, the Roman Empire. He could do no miracles in his hometown because people had no room in their heart to believe that the little boy from down the street in Nazareth could be anything or do anything. He arrived into a room that has no room for him. You see, God's plan for your life is bigger than you could possibly imagine. Let me say that again. God's plan for your life is way bigger than ever you could, you could possibly ever imagine. You, you may have been an accident to your parents, but you were never an accident in the heart of God. I, when I see this room this morning, I see a room full of people who are stamped with purpose, who are stamped with destiny. If you're alive and you're breathing today, God's got a plan for your life. He has something he wants to do in you and through you for his kingdom. You are marked with purpose. It's bigger than you could possibly imagine. And the same is true for this house. And this is the space I came to talk to us in today. God's plan for this house is bigger than you could possibly imagine. Thank God for all that he's done. Thank God for almost 40 years, 37 or 38 years of faithfulness. 
in this house. Thank you to those of you who have been here for decades, who have invested and built. But how many of you would have the faith to believe that all that God has done is not all that God is going to do? That God's plan for this house is bigger than we can possibly dare to dream or imagine. But here's what happens. When God sets out to do something, he looks for people who are willing to make room for him. He looks for people, he looks for churches that are willing to get a bit uncomfortable and make room for more. Make room for all that God wants to do. We see this in Luke chapter 14. Jesus tells the parable of the wedding banquet. And he tells the parable of a man who pre prepared a wedding banquet. This would have been the party of the, the, the year. This would have been the invite you wanted to get. And it says that the man sends out invitations and waits for the replies, but the servants came back with very lame replies to the invitation of the party. We see one person says, I have bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. Okay, I'm not sure what you're doing on a Friday night in Middletown, but I sure hope it's more exciting than looking at a field you bought. I bought five yoke of oxen. I must go examine them. I mean, this was a real, <laughs> real good set of excuses, right? So what does he do? He goes, okay, I've got to send out more invitations. So he sends out the servants again to another invite list. He says, go out and invite more to come. But still he received declines. In other words, he received word back from people that did not have room for the party. And so what does he do? On the final round of invites, he sends out the servants and he says, go to the highways. Go to the byways. Compel them to come. I am looking for people who have room for this party I want to throw. And the truth of the matter is in the kingdom of God, we have been invited to the party of a lifetime. We have been invited to this party called salvation. It's a party where our sins are forgiven. It's a party where our past isn't our future. It's a party where we can have new life, where we can have new hope in Jesus. And God is on the move. And he wants he wants to do something in Middletown. He wants to do something in the Hudson Valley. He wants to do something in this county for the glory of his kingdom. But he's looking. Is there a company of people that would have room for more? You have room for what I want to do in this region. We have to make room. So I guess I came to challenge us in two very specific areas today. And the first one is this, if we're going to see God do all that he wants to do, number one, we need to make room physically. We need to make room physically. I'll never forget that night with the pregnancy test. My wife's telling me new family is on the way. So what am I trying to figure out? Okay, we need a baby's room. And the baby's room has junk in it. God knows why we were paying for an entire bedroom with junk in it, but we were. And now it's time to make room. So we got to clear out the junk. And then we go to Target. And we get the registry gun or the registry app now, I guess, or whatever. And you go down the, you know, you go down the, we need 10 of these, 3 of these, and 29 of these. You never know you needed to raise, so much stuff to raise a kid in 2019 as you do now. You know, I need, I need 5 of these because we're making room. Making room physically. As a church, this is a very exciting season. This is the season when we expand the building. This is the season when we start a new campus. This is the season where we start a new ministry. We start a new program. This is, this is the expansion season because we're believing God for more. We like these seasons. These are fun seasons. To give you a little bit of background... Your pastor, if I know him well enough, God regularly speaks to our pastors. I know he does to mine. And quite often in our church's history, my pastor would get up on the platform and say, all right, family, I feel like God's talked to me about something. I feel like we're supposed to do something to make room for more. And I think what the heart of God looks for is, is this the kind of house where we get bigger on the inside, where we commit to, I'm going to make room physically. I'm going to give to that thing. 
I'm going to serve that thing. If it's in my pastor's heart, I'm with him heart and soul. We see this in the parable of the field in Matthew chapter 13. Jesus tells a parable. It goes like this. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Here's the principle. To get the treasure, you don't just take the treasure. That would be called theft. To get the treasure, you have to buy the field. If you buy the field, you get the treasure. And in the kingdom of God, and in the church, our treasure is people. Our treasure is people who are far from God finding new life in Jesus. Our treasure is people whose past isn't their future. Our, 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 our treasure is addictions broken on people's lives. Our treasure is marriages restored. Our treasure is sick bodies healed by the power of God. Our, our treasure is young people who grow up, who never walk the way of the world, who serve God all the days of their life. That is our treasure. That is why we build. But to get the treasure, guess what? We had to buy the field. Buying the field means like expanding a new campus. It means I'm going to give to this thing, Pastor. I'm going to serve. I'm going to volunteer. I'm going to stretch. Not for me. We don't give and build new children's classrooms for our own kids. I think some of the most selfless things that happen in church life is when people give to things that don't benefit them at all. The couple that's believing God for kids that gives to the children's ministry when they don't even have kids. To me, that's the, one of the greatest acts of faith I ever see in the local church is when people give and make room for more, even as they're believing God for something in their own life. We make room physically. But these are fun seasons, hey? These are good seasons. We love when new life comes into the house. We love when the house is full. But then something else happens, and this is where I wanted to park for a minute. We make room physically and God does what God does. And new life comes into the house and growth comes into the house. But then something more important has to happen in us. We don't just make room physically. I think my second point for you today is we have to make room in our hearts. We have to make room in our hearts. I'll never forget July 2nd, 2011, my beautiful, amazing baby girl was born. She's absolutely the best. And you know that moment where you're there, you're holding your child for the first time. It's getting on the gram. Get the right filters going. My wife's like, keep me out of the picture. I'm like, okay, baby, I got you. It's a beautiful moment. It's a big day. Family's there to celebrate. We're so excited. Then it takes all of about 10 minutes for your new beautiful baby girl to poop her diaper. And I specifically remember on this day looking at my wife going, do we do this? Or does like the nurse do this? That's why they're here, right? Like, I'm just here to like Instagram. That's really why I was here. I was just here to like, like have a child. I didn't, I, and Lindsay literally looks at me like, you changed the diaper. <laughs> I just had this child. You can take care of the first diaper. Then all of a sudden, that night, I'm up in the middle of the night to no benefit of my own, mind you. I'm not the one that didn't eat before bed, and now I'm hungry. I'm not the one that peed myself in the middle of the night. But all of a sudden, I'm up taking care of the very thing I prayed for. I'm now up for no benefit of my own. And here I spent nine months preparing for this thing. Nine months believing for this thing. Nine month countdown. Eight month countdown. What are all these things that we do? Gender reveals and now the beautiful thing is here but it's pooping itself. And if I'm not careful, I end up resenting the very thing I prayed for. If I didn't make room in my heart for more. What this looks like in church life is new people come in, but all of a sudden the parking lot's full. Where am I going to park? All of a sudden someone's sitting in that seat that has your invisible name tag on it. You're like, I've sat there for 20 years. Well, not today, sister. You're in the back. <laughs> 
All of a sudden, new people join your team and they mess it all up. They do it all different than you would do it. You got it perfectly organized, you perfectionists, and you got it all down to a system, and all of a sudden, it's all messed up. Because new family came into town, and new family's in the house, and come on, can we talk today? Like, this is the real, Here, here's one. You used to get applauded for something, and you used to get praised for something, being so good, and then all of a sudden, somebody else comes along, and now they're getting the praise, and they're getting the applause, and you're like, I'm still here. But no one notices me anymore. If I had it my way in my church, I've been there for a lot of years, like I'd still be on the worship team. I was on the worship team back in the day, but apparently I got too old. So they kicked me off. Like eight, I'm still trying to like look young with like my leather jacket, but I mean 40's on the way for me now, and it's like, man, I aged out of this sucker. And so now I'm like the coach to the worship team. You know what that means? That means sit on the front row and tell them how they did. That's no fun. I want, to be, I want to be the one up there singing. I don't want to coach somebody. I, I want to be in the game, Pastor. I want to do my thing. And, and, but it's not where my house needs me now. It's not my best yes for the house. It's not the gift that best serves my house anymore. And if we're not careful, we can enter into a place of resentment if we don't make room in our hearts. Can we talk today, family? Is this real? The cheetah is one of the fastest and most impressive animals on the planet. A cheetah can go from zero to 40 miles an hour in three strides. That is faster than most vehicles. A cheetah can run on the freeway at 70 miles an hour. A cheetah is built for speed. A cheetah has a slender rib cage, has a tail that's a counterweight. You can tell I looked at Wikipedia, right? Cheetah's a lean, mean, killing machine. A cheetah has incredible eyesight, by the way, too. So as it's descending on its prey, the cheetah can see any dangers coming, wide vision. So think about this. All the vision and all of the skill to get the job done. There's one problem with the cheetah, though. After about a quarter mile at top speed, the cheetah overheats, runs out of speed, and slows down. And that's because the cheetah's heart is too small. The cheetah overheats. The cheetah is well known for killing its prey and not being able to eat it because it's too tired. Usually for a larger predator to come along and take their prey from them. I think this takes more people out of church life than anything. I'll be honest. This has almost taken me out of church life. If I'm being real with you today, the opportunity to be offended, the opportunity to feel out of place, the opportunity to feel overlooked from the very thing I prayed and built for, we have to make room in our hearts for the very thing God wants to do. I'll never forget, there's a man in our church named Larry. I love Larry. I love his family. Beautiful, beautiful family in our church. Larry was our children's pastor for years. Larry served on our executive team, significant leader in our church. But Larry's season as children's pastor came to an end. And if I'm honest with you, it probably wasn't by his doing. But his time was done and he agreed to be done in children's ministry. It was hard for him. It's hard from going at serving at a high level to not being involved anymore. But I loved what kicked up on the inside of Larry. Because Larry decided I'm, he wasn't done yet. So now if you, we host a conference every summer where pastors and leaders from all over, the, all over North America come now. If you came to our conference next summer you, where you would find Larry... Is Larry is serving drinks in the pastor's lounge for lead pastors. Pretty big difference from children's ministry. You'll see him with a white button-up shirt and a black apron serving drinks. Larry rocks that room. Larry walks around that room making every pastor and every leader feel like a million bucks. Larry added up in his mind somewhere along the way, if I refresh a leader, that leader could go home and change their entire city. 
So now, there are pastors that come to our conference, and one of the highlights of the whole stinking conference is seeing Larry in the lounge with a glass of water for them because he makes them feel so special. And you know what? I went up to Larry one day and I said, thank you for getting big on the inside. Thank you for going the distance for our church. Thank you for not, you know, not, not tapping out somewhere along the way when you could have got offended, when you could have felt you're, you're, you were out of place. Thank you for finding the next act of serving Jesus because you're changing more lives than you realize. If we're going to make room on the inside, we're going to have to commit to a couple things. Number one, we're going to have to embrace inconvenience. Okay, that never gets a lot of amens. That's okay. We'll get there. We have confused, somewhere along the way, we have confused the gospel and God's blessing on our lives for being convenient. There is something that happens in our discipleship as believers when church switches from being a place we show up to get to church being a place we show up to give. A place where we show up for church being a place we contribute toward. If we're going to make room, we're going to have to embrace the inconvenience that new family members bring. We're going to have to embrace inconvenience. One of the most selfless things you'll ever do is give something that you'd rather keep for yourself. God will never ask you to give something you don't have. But he may ask you to give something you want to keep for yourself. Man, I, we could take this vacation but instead, we're going to do a staycation, and we're going to take that, and we're going to give to the house. Or I'm willing to show up, and I'm willing to, I'm willing to park at the back parking spot and leave the front spots today for someone who's away from God, who's coming to church for the first time. That's how churches feel and sound that have a heart for new family. <laughs> we're going to have to embrace inconvenience. The second thing we're going to have to do, if you're going to, if we're going to get bigger on the inside, is you're going to have to fight for your place, not your peace. You're going to have to fight for your place, not your peace. What does that mean? My mom loves to do thousand piece jigsaw puzzles. Any jigsaw puzzlers in the house, like raise your hand if you love to do jigsaw puzzles. I have one question for all eternity. Why? <laughs> Why? Um, only heaven knows. Um, I have neither the concentration nor the, anyways, it's just, it's a mess. But my mom loves to do jigsaw puzzles. And, and here's how this goes, right? Like you're, you take the box and you've picked a beautiful scene for the day that you're going to spend hours on. And what, what, how does this work? You take a piece out of the box and you... <laughs> Trees, you know. It's going to go right there. The second piece of madness comes up, and it's, you know, it's a window. It's right there. Oh, God, it's a person. Thank God we can find this one. You know, here's a face. I know where this one goes. This, this is how it goes, and just looking for the right place for the piece. Well, as the picture comes together, as the trees come together and the buildings come together, what happens, all of a sudden you start to realize, oh, this, these pieces are out of place. They actually belong over here. Or this window doesn't belong to that building, it belongs to this building. And here's the lesson. The value of the piece is not in question. It's just the place of the piece that's in question. We know the piece belongs because it's on the box lid. We know it has significance because it's on the box lid. It just may need to slide over to a different place in order to complete the picture. What do we do when we can't find a place for the piece? Do we chuck it? You just throw it away? I'll tell you, when you get 999 pieces in and that one's missing, guess which piece just became the most valuable? All of a sudden, couch cushions are being overturned, right? All of a sudden, pets and children are being interrogated. 
vacuum cleaners are being emptied, you know. I've got to find the peace. The peace has gone missing. And guess what? Without you, this peace, this, this puzzle that God is putting together, this beautiful picture called family church, this picture is incomplete without your peace. We need you on this team. We know you belong because God brought you here. You, the value of your peace is not in question. It's just sometimes the house needs us to slide over here. Or slide over here. This is how it feels building church. You put pieces where they think, you think they belong at the beginning, but I need you to slide. This is how I've gone 37 years in one church. Is I've just had a heart toward my pastor. Put me in, coach. You need me to pitch today, I'll pitch. You need me to play right field, I'll play right field. You need me to coach, I'll coach. Just put me in wherever the house needs me. I'm in heart and soul. It was never about my place. It was always about the lost. It was always about people far from God coming to new life in Jesus. That's what this whole thing was about from the beginning anyways. We've got to get big on the inside. My last thought for you on making room on the inside is you're going to have to overlook offense. You're going to have to overlook offense. Hmm. Again, I think this takes more people out of church life than need be. Along the way, you stay around church for five minutes, and you will have the opportunity to get offended. Someone in this building will rub you the wrong way. You know the person right now across the room you're, you're hoping is like hearing this message today? You're like, God, give them ears. Let them hear it today, Lord. <laughs> That's what we're talking about right there. Man, I love the family, but sometimes your brothers and sisters get on your nerves. Sometimes they act a little crazy. And you have to overlook offense. Let me say it like this. There's a difference between feeling offended and living offended. Every single one of us will feel offense in our lives. That is called living the human experience. To live is to feel offended from time to time. But there is a difference between feeling offended and drinking the poison and living offended. To live offended means that this hurt I'm experiencing will become a permanent injury in my life. It becomes a soul wound. It becomes a place where I can't move forward from because I'm hurting. I don't pretend that these moments are easy. I've had my moments. I wouldn't pretend to say that these moments um, are easy to walk through. But I will tell you that if you drink the poison of offense, that it will stop you dead in your tracks in your walk with God. And you will end up finding yourself wanting to leave the very place that God assigned you, where God brought you. So many people in church life leave under the guise of God is leading me on. Sometimes I'm like, no, they're, no, he's not. No, he's not. This is what the enemy loves to do. The enemy loves to bring division. Right in the middle of the family. You see, the enemy can't win. We already know the end of the story. We win. And so the gates of hell can't prosper against the church. So the enemy already knows he can't beat us. He can't win. But this is how he works, as he tries to work then from the inside. Can I at least get you distracted and hurt so you become no threat to my kingdom, is what he says to us. Can I at least numb you out so that you don't work again? I just think that the healthiest churches just regularly throw off a fence. You know what we need to do? We need to be better at going to each other. And saying, you know what, we need to have a conversation right now. I love you. I may not like the situation we're in, but I love you. I'm for you. You're my sister. I'm your brother. Like, I am with you. I'm committed to you. I'm, I'm with you, heart and soul. We got to get through this. Let's overlook offense. Let's, let's, maybe I should reword that. Let's be undeterred by offense. Let's keep moving in the face of offense. Watch how the beautiful picture of God's grace will come into full view in this house. When we overlook offense. Is this helping anyone today? Is this all right? Making room on the inside. Okay, I got one more thought for you. And I'm done. She's playing me off like the Oscars, so it's time to go. <laughs> it's 
time to go. I have one more thought for you today. It's the best thought of the day. When we make room, God does miracles. When we make room, God does miracles. This summer, I got to visit Israel for the first time. It was so, it was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful experience. Got to go to a little town called Capernaum, right on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. It's a little town. I got to see the site where Mark chapter 2 happened. In Mark chapter 2, we see the account of Jesus teaching in a house one day. Jesus' ministry, word is getting out. And so the house was full. There was no room. And the house is full. And Jesus is teaching, and little did he know that four men had gone and found their paralyzed friend to bring him to Jesus. They were on their way. They had such big hearts. They were so big in their hearts. And if they knew we will stop at nothing to get our friend to Jesus, we know if we can get our friend to Jesus, he will be healed. That was their faith. Winding their way through the narrow little alleys and streets of Capernaum only to arrive at the house, and the house was full. There was no room. What did these men do? Did they come back for a second service? They come back the next week. I mean, he can live another week longer, right? He's been his whole life. I mean, what's the big deal? What did they do? It's important, by the way, when we're reading the Bible that we don't sanitize the Bible. This is not a Veggie Tales story we are reading. This is not Flannel Graph. Anyone remember Flannel Graph, by the way? Any old school Sunday school teachers in Flannel Graph? Come on, yeah, you know, you know you're OG. You were at church in the 80s. It's not a Flannel Graph story. This is a what did these men do? They brought their paralyzed friend. There was no room in the house. So they preceded somehow. I don't know how they did this. They preceded to get their friend up on the roof of someone else's house. They destroyed someone else's property. Can you imagine? You're Jesus. You're in this house teaching, and all of a sudden, someone's coming through that roof right now. Dirt's falling. Tiles are falling. Someone's coming through the house, and all of a sudden, this man is lowered on this mat to the feet of Jesus. And what does it say in Mark chapter 2? When Jesus saw their faith. Whose faith? The paralyzed man's faith? The crowd's faith? The worship team's faith? <laughs> when Jesus saw their faith, that they would stop at nothing. They were so big on the inside. That he looked at the paralyzed man and he said, friend, your sins are forgiven, be healed. And on that day, that man walked home free. He walked home whole. He walked home maybe for the first time in years because some men were really big on the inside. Come on, when we make room, God does miracles. Think about when you make room in your day and you walk across the room to encourage someone, God may do a miracle in that person's heart. When we make room in our families, God does miracles. So I want to pray with you today. Would you stand to your feet? No one leaving, if you would. Can we just honor this moment? If this message resonates with you at all today, well, you're saying, I'm willing to commit to make room. I'm willing to commit to make room physically. I'm willing to commit to make room in my heart. If this message has at all spoken to you today, would you just lift up your hands one more time to heaven today? And God, I thank you for this great church. Thank you for family church. Thank you for a church that's generous at its core. Thank you for a church on mission. Thank you, Father, with a church so rich in history, yet a church so forward-looking. God, I speak a blessing over this house today. I pray, Father, that as we commit to make room, Jesus, I pray you would do miracles. I pray that you would do miracles in this house. Miracles of salvation. Miracles of healing. I thank you, God, that all you've done is not all you're going to do. But I thank you that this house has a great future. I thank you that the gates of hell cannot prevail against this house today. That no weapon formed in hell will prosper against this house in Jesus' name. 
In fact, we make commitments all over this room today, Jesus, that offense and division have no place in this house. Strife has no place in this house. We are a house united. We are a house together. We are a house on mission, all for the glory of the kingdom of God. In fact, I pray that when people walk into this building, I pray that they would know we are your disciples by our love for each other, by our big, open, wide hearts, Father. That when people walk into this house, the welcome home would not be a slogan. It would truly be a culture. It would truly be a mission and that we would see people far from God all over this county come to new life in you, from death to life. May that be our story. I speak a blessing on this house today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, does anybody agree and believe with that today? In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Okay, I have one more question for you today. Again, one more time with every head bowed, every eye closed, every every person in prayer, every believer praying right now, if you would. I have one more question for you today, and that is, do you know Jesus? Have you made room for Jesus in your life? Maybe you're here today, and if you'd be honest, you're away from God in your heart. Maybe you're here, and you've never heard an invitation to follow Jesus, serve Jesus. Maybe you're here today, and maybe you've grown up in church like me. Maybe you know exactly what I'm doing right now. But if you'd be honest, you're away from God in your heart and your life. You're not living for Him. I don't know your name or your story. But I want to offer you the most important thing I could offer you today, and that's a new start with Jesus. Do you have room in your heart for Jesus? Do you have room in your heart for all that He wants to do? People around the room are praying for you right now. In fact, I believe that for someone in the room, you're... Your future, your eternity hangs in the balance right now. And I want to invite you to the greatest decision you'll ever make. The decision to make room for Jesus, to say yes to him today. To receive his love, to receive his grace. You might say, Brandon, you have no idea where I've been. You have no idea what I've done. You have no idea where I was last night. You have no idea how dirty I feel. Friend, none of that matters today. My Bible says that nothing you've done can separate you from the love of God. If you're here today and you open up your life and you make room for Jesus, Jesus will come. He will do a miracle. He will make all things new in your life starting today. I just wonder who I'm talking to. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, every believer in prayer, if I'm talking to you today and you want to say yes to Jesus, saying, Brandon, include me in this prayer. Include me in this moment. I need today to be my day of new beginnings. Will you do me a favor all over this room on the count of three? Will you lift up your hands? Let me see who you are. Just lift up a hand to heaven. Give me a chance. I want to pray with you today. A prayer of new beginnings. Hands are already going up. Come on, on the count of three. One, two, three. If that's you, you want to say yes to Jesus, lift up your hand. Let me see who you are. Keep it up boldly, by the way. People saying yes to Jesus all over the room. This is awesome today. There are miracles in the house right now. Someone is about to be raised to new life in Jesus because of what we're about to do. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Okay, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. If your hand is raised, keep it up. And say this loud, say this proud, throw all the faith you have behind these words. If you are a believer, will you say this out loud full of faith to support someone else this morning? Can we do this? Let's all say together. Say, Lord Jesus, welcome to my world. I invite you today. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Make me a new person. I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is alive. And I declare today, I will never be the same. The past is in the past. I am a new creation today because of Jesus. In Jesus' name, all God's people said a big amen and amen. Come on, one more time. Let's give it up for everyone that has made a decision for Jesus. Sorry, it's second service, and I got one minute. So I'm going to take one more minute from your pastor. I love these guys so much. If you don't have a home church, if God has brought you here, 
and you've never made a public decision that this is your house and this is your home, can I just ask you, what in the world are you waiting for? This is a good house. This is the house where you can grow. This is the house where you can flourish. So here's what I want you to do. If you've never made the, if you're still kicking the tires, even in your heart, you've never made a decision, will you talk to a leader, find someone with a badge on, ask them how you can get involved, do all the things, whatever they say, do one of everything. Just do all the things. Give it a year. Watch what God will do in your life. I promise you, God will do something really special. Amen. God bless you. Amen. That's so good. You know that story, just two seconds, that story that he that he shared at the end there just always makes me so angry for the homeowner whose house got ripped up, like his roof got ripped off. And I'm thinking to myself, who paid for the roof to get fixed? Right? That's like my whole mindset. But if the people who were blocking the doorway would have made room, we could have had a miracle without ripping a roof off. If they would have just got out of the way, the guy could have got healed. And I just think sometimes we block the way for miracles to happen because of the way things used to be and because we get selfish about us. Um, and so it's a great, great word. I did not set him up. I didn't ask him to preach. I had no idea what he was preaching today. But I want to bless you today. Father, we thank you and we praise you for a new perspective, a new mission, a new mindset to follow you, to make room in our lives, to make room in our hearts, to serve you and to make room for others to serve you with the talents and the giftings and abilities that are on the inside of them. Lord, I bless everyone here today. They're the head and not the tail above and never beneath. Everything they set their hands to would prosper and be successful. I thank you, Lord, for your protection as we travel home in this weather. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you.